So, Hi, everybody. Rebecca Nelson with you once again for another fantastic virtual tasting with Becker Vineyards. Uh, tonight, we are on our second pour, uh, pouring of our Dolcetto. So tonight, we're doing the 2017 Dolcetto Reserve, also from the Wilmoth Family Vineyard uh, up there in Tokyo, Texas. And I hope that you guys have this in your glass and you've got it swirling and are ready to get going. Tonight, we have with us uh, Dr. Joe Becker. And uh, we also have a miniature uh, executive producer there in that screen as well. You'll get to meet him too. And then we have our winemaker, John Leahy, with us tonight also. And I'm going to stick around and hang out and, and uh, taste this wine and discuss it with you as well. I'm going to turn it over to John, get us started. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Rebecca. Thanks for that great introduction. And I'm very happy that you're joining us for another broadcast. So <laughs> don't worry, I'll only ask the softball questions. <laughs> So as, as, uh, as soon as Joe comes back on, we'll have him say a few words. But in the meantime, we're going to cheat a little bit here because we're going to get everybody going on the uh, on the wine. Um, take a swirl and a sniff and a taste. And while you do that, um, Dr. Joe, would you care to give us a few words? I need to check it out. Okay, well, this, this, it's good. Um, this is my um, my executive producer, uh, Noel Noel, uh, also known as Batman. And... Um, he and I um, are both just um, always, always lucky to get to do this, and um, um, you know, thinking, thinking about everybody that's, uh, as you know, my father and I say every night we do this. Thinking about everybody that's in the hospital, everybody that's that's not here, uh, to friends that are hospitalized, to friends that are working in the hospital, to um, to people that we're all thinking about, to our extended family, um, well, welcome again. And um, but I'm just very excited about our our special guest, Noel Noel, here with us tonight. Well, uh, Nolan, welcome to the show. How's it going, buddy? Good. Good. Did you did you enjoy lunch on Saturday at the winery? Yeah. And how was your wine at the at lunch? How was that sparkling apple grape juice? Good. Good. Perfect. See, just goes to show, Joe, that there's a great vintage for everybody. That's right. <laughs> so let's kick things off. I'm, I, I'm seeing some folks check in here, so we should probably get very serious and discuss not only the nature of the wine, but the terroir, the demarcation of what makes this wine better than other Dolcettos. Why is it that Becker is the best producer of wine in Texas, and how come other people can't keep up? Oh, wait a minute. Did I say that out loud? John, <laughs> that's the quiet part. <laughs> Inside, it's coming out. No. So with, with all that and the good naturedness, um, I would like to draw attention one brief moment that uh, to our, our neighbors and our, our fellow compatriots in the wine industry in Texas and offer them a cheers as harvest has started. We know the hard work that we've had for everybody. Um, we just got our Sauvignon Blanc in yesterday. Nine and a half beautiful tons in the tank, 23 bricks at 3.85 pH. It's smelling great. It's cold settling now, and uh, soon it will turn into the next wonderful vintage. And hopefully, something great will come out of 2020. <laughs> so, Rebecca, uh, lead us off, if you will, uh, on, a, on just the nose, not the taste, just the nose. And then, Joe, I want you to do the same. So, what are you getting? So, for me on this one, I get. Um, I get cherry on the nose on this one. And a spice that I can't identify. Like a brown spice or? Yeah. 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 You know, this I is where I always go to you and Rachel and I go, so what is it I'm smelling? There's a spice. I need help. Get me that next level toward it. And this is also what I always try and tell people when we're in the tasting room, when we're doing a tasting is when people are always like, what am I smelling? What am I smelling? We'll start with where you are. Can you get floral? Can you get fruit? Can you get spice? You know, start if, there. If and you already know the lecture, then <laughs> go through it in your mind. <laughs> start, start big and then go find somebody to help you get a little bit. Further. So hey, that's so, what I got. So, uh, Joe, what, what are you getting in the nose, sir? On the nose, interestingly, I get uh, I, I, I get what Rebecca's saying. I get sort of a lighter, uh, a lighter cherry note, but I also get you know they they describe um, Dolcetto as sometimes having kind of an orchard blossom note yep. to it, and I, I get a little bit of that on the nose as well. It's a it's a it's a very it's a it's a very interesting aroma. You know, it to me, I get it, and this is going to be very specific, and I apologize, but having um, 
lived a long time around apple and, and um, orchards and, and plums, um, I'm getting that orchard blossom. I know exactly it's that faint hint of what is to become an apple or what is to become a plum. Very faint hint of both, but a more floral and deeper sweetness. Like almost as a, if it were palatable, it would be a sticky sweetness. Yeah. But this is not a sweet wine. So it's right. very fascinating to me. It's coming out quite a bit in the bottle. Um, and it, it's interesting, you know, because, uh, you know, dolcetto literally means little sweet one. And, um, and, and that's, I, I think, you know, obviously there's no sugar in this, but that's, I feel like that's a lot where that, that, that comes from is that wonderful fruit that, that gives yes. that aroma. I, I really don't think it's much of a mystery. You know, there's been so many theories. One of my favorite is that it was used to make money. So it was the little sweet one, you know, and stuff. But I really do think you've hit upon it. I, I no mystery at all. That sweetness in there, which is a demarcation for our, all four of our vintages at Dolcetto so far. You know, after a couple of years, it starts to have that wonderful sweet edge. Yeah. So Rebecca, lead us through your first uh, sample tasting, even though I know you've tasted it before, but go ahead and give it a taste and see what your palate says. So my palate says plum, but a very like almost like a red plum, not like a not like a black plum. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and that's what I get first. And then I do get a little bit of a pepperiness on the finish. I don't have. You know, it's funny because I just. Sorry, I just decanted this about not quite an hour ago, and it's really starting to open up for me right now. Yeah. So, not quite a pepperiness. So, so Joe, um, what are you getting on the palate, sir? I think there's two interesting notes on the palate with this one, um, um, and I think you're absolutely right. You know, they say to, that that, that um, you know two 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 years out or so is the optimal time for a lot of the dolcettos. Although I think this one will age very nicely, but I think um, on the palate I get kind of a a nice licorice note, and um, as we were saying before the uh, broadcast started, I, I do get I get kind of it's an interesting kind of um, bittersweet um, cherry finish on on the end of this. I think it's kind of it's kind of interesting, um, and and you know it's said sometimes that that dolcettos can have um, almost kind of a pruny note to them. I know that's we don't say that very much about wine, but I get a little bit of that on the on the uh, back palate as well. Yeah. I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. On the back palate, I've got, or the mid palate for me, there's enough weight in here, but on the mid palate, I start to get, um, you were saying earlier, Rebecca, a uh, unidentifiable spice. Mm -hmm. And earlier with just the hint of ethyl acetate in there, which is common in a bottle that's been closed for a few years, right. it helps carry some of those deeper notes out. When that blows off, then that herbaceousness starts to come out. And I'm not wondering if it isn't a very mild cinnamon edge, uh -huh. um, you know, with over, imagine if you were to put, I don't know why you would, but imagine if you were to put cinnamon and a little bit of thyme on top of some fruit, you know, it, it um, okay. it, I, 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 I don't know if I can explain it any clearer, but. No, uh, that's really clear. That's actually a great descriptor. So anyway, I'm looking over here at some of the questions that are starting to pop up. And Angela, I'll take your question right now because it is harvest. And the question is for later for harvesting machines that go through the vines. How do they manage to pull the grape clusters without damaging the leaves? They don't. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, the real story is we, um, inside the machine, you're gonna see uh, lots of little miniature um, people about that tall. And they just go through and pick the individual berries. Now, the reason it's so tall is we have to have about a thousand of them in there. Is that John, that's like something Stefan would say on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> so, Angela, the uh, healthy leaves will stay on there. It really, it looks like it's vibrating the living bejesus out of those vines, and it, and it really does move quickly. But um, and we do get a fair amount of leaf matter in there, but the fans um, in there blow the the older leaves out that fall off. The healthier leaves actually stay on. So, and the and the the idea too is that. Um, it's not, you know, the idea, it's, it's not always perfect in practice, but, but that in terms of the grape clusters, it, it, it should, a heavier, riper grape cluster should fall off. And, yes, and, and they the fruit should stay behind. Absolutely. You know, when we're picking stuff like, so this came in about 23 bricks and it, and it was for me for this year. So I made a stylistic choice. We could have let it stay until it's 24, but it made a beautiful wine. Um, picked it at 23. It's going to make a beautiful wine. 
stylistically, it's going to be much leaner than our previous Sauvignon Blanc. So I wanted to, to play with that a little bit. So the, the interesting part is there were still some very big portions of that older block that were very, very ripe, and they just came off quickly. And that happens a lot, especially in the red, uh, red harvest, because I do tend to wait um, until those, those are 24 and a half to, to 25 and a half bricks. And they start falling off the rachis is just just as soon as the machine starts vibrating. And sometimes you'll go back through and actually see the cluster with no grapes on it sitting there. And, and I made up a beautiful story when a, a, a guest of ours asked us about that. They're like, what, is that? I said, yeah, it's a vanishing disease. Um, <laughs> grapes just <laughs> overnight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's why they don't let me out in public, Angela. Now you know. <laughs> so, so anyway, let's get back to the dolcetto at hand because Jet is watching and I'm sure he's shaking his head. And if you want stories about harvest, you need to talk to Jet because he can make up some doozies. <laughs> so um, with this blend, Joe, what do you think? It is a little different. You, you know already, you both know what the blend is. So before we reveal, what do you think in comparison to the previous uh, vintage that we tried, the 18? I think it's, um, it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, to my palate, it's, it's, a, it's a different style. You know, I think that the, um, you know, the, the, the Petit Syrah and the Moved that was in the 18, I think brings out a little bit more of the, the, the darker cherry notes. I think this, this to me, and, it, and they're both good, this to me, seems to be more in the, the direction of kind of the classic Piedmont style, a um, little bit lighter fruit note to it, but, but still very interesting. So of the five areas uh, that are uh, um, controls for uh, DOCs for Dolcetto, which one does this most readily remind you of? <laughs> 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 You're safe if you take the album up. So, um, Rebecca, your comparison between the 18 and, and this one. So, uh, I was telling this before we got started, this one, uh, and I think now that I know what the blend is, it makes me feel a little bit more confident in saying this, but this one is, like like Joe said, to me, it's a different style. It's it's a lighter bodied, um, very smooth, very great dolcetto. The 18 that we had, to me, I think is a more full bodied dolcetto. Yeah. While it still has some of those notes that you can tell is definitely a year or you know a year newer, it's it's a year younger, um, and so it definitely has a little bit of those brighter notes at the beginning, um, but it it has a fuller body and a fuller mouth feel than this Dolcetto. This Dolcetto is just super smooth, super easy drinking, and I have to remind myself that it's fourteen point five percent alcohol because. It's really smooth drinking. Yeah, it is. And so, you know, 2017, we're going to back to that uh, particular drum beat about the ripeness of the harvest of 2017. Um, so, you know, for those of you joining us that, uh, that weren't here a few weeks ago, we were doing some of the 2017s. Um, in 2017, uh, unfortunately, Texas and part of the, um, the uh, southern coast got hit by hurricane. And it deluged Houston and the Houstonites, I mean, it just, your heart goes out to everything, you know, that kind of storm and what happened on the, the Gulf Coast. But the, I won't say the up, upside to it, the, the consequence of that was keeping a high pressure front over the high plains for a month longer than they normally is up there. Cooler nighttime temperatures in late August, September and nice, average warm days kept for a very long ripening edge. And so we get a fuller phenolic development out of the fruit up there than we've had previously seen. Yeah. It's not that the previous fruits were bad, it's just that all of a sudden you were like, oh my gosh, this we really can have this in this wine. And so this Dolcetto experiences that. And I think, uh, Joe, back to Joe's point about pointing out that it does taste more like a traditional Dolcetto, um, it's because it, it, phenolically it was super ripe. Of course, it was also super sugar ripe and hence the 14 and a half. So the blend, it's very simple. Um, it's 95% Dolcetto and 5% Kunwa from the farmhouse vineyards up there. So it's not a pairing that you will find anywhere else normally. <laughs> so, um, and- I feel like you make a lot of those, John. Yes, I do. And it's, <laughs> um, I have an overwhelming good sense of taste. As you can tell, I dress myself. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Those, uh, <laughs> We've got somebody joining us from Farmington, Minnesota. I hope oh, you're part of <laughs> <laughs> those uh, those single vineyard uh, roans. This, I mean, this was the greer for those great single vineyard roans that we, our single varietal yeah. roans that we made. Yeah, the three seed, the the Cunha, the Carignan, and the Senso. Yeah, Literally. yeah. And seventeen also saw a um, uh, some really good Cabernet. I mean, I don't really think that there was a bad wine in seventeen. We got a lot yeah. of medals in seventeen vintages. Yep, yep, absolutely. This got a gold at San Francisco as well. It got yeah. a gold at San Francisco Chronicle and a gold yep. at the um, International. International. Yep. yep. So uh, very good point. This, um, which I'll take any day of the week. Um, we, you know, absolutely. Um, so now comes the point in time that we want to discuss possible food pairing. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm really hungry for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I could eat the hell out of some yogurt right now. <laughs> okay, so Joe, I'm going to start with you uh, and give Rebecca a moment to um, to come up with a, a pairing. But so I have, uh, I actually, I have, I have two thoughts. I have one um, that I was thinking about. Um, when I was decanting this and that, and it would be lovely to have this with a um, kind of a, a, a braised beef with, a, with a, a red wine sauce with maybe a, a kind of a creamy or polenta. But, oh, but, but, man. Yeah. But, but downstairs, you know, the other, the other thing that I think goes nicely with this is, um, um, you know, risotto with maybe a, um, some, with maybe some, some truffle, some truffle oil, um, but I've got some I've got some shrimp and risotto downstairs that I'm I'm gonna make as soon as we get off the broadcast. I think we'll we'll do well with this. Uh, I ho I hope it's okay for you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> you it through. Perhaps you'll find something that'll go. <laughs> I'll be thinking about you guys working in the harvest. Well, thank you very much. That makes me feel so <laughs> I'm a flutter. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, what <laughs> What? Still, nobody's making fun of me on Facebook. I'm watching. <laughs> they're uh, too scared to engage. <laughs> they're too scared to engage. <laughs> uh, anyway, Rebecca, what would you pair with this? So this dolcetto, I'm a sucker for pairing this with a pasta. I think this would be great with a bolognese. I would. Mm -hmm. I think it would be fantastic. You know, um, so two things for me, if you don't mind me getting on the food soapbox. So um, apparently I was told today that I'm not supposed to cook anything tonight at all. Jody's got enough food leftovers to, to go. I've been on a cooking frenzy for the last few days. But last night I made homemade tomato soup and a, uh, a version of a grilled cheese sandwich. Ooh. Now the tomato soup, yeah. So the secret for me is to get and take a red bell pepper and um, put it in the oven until it's, you know, just it's uh, literally uh, the boiling with a little bit of um, blackness on there that's blistering and then take it out, chop it up. Um, so you want that. But in the pan, I always start with browning tomato paste and a little of olive oil until mm -hmm. it starts turning dark golden and really bubbly. That brings out a really depth of flavor. Mm -hmm. And then from there, a, a regular mirepoix and then the broth that um, <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at me, and, and two to three tablespoons of duck and veal demi glaze, just for reasons. <laughs> sounds amazing. How did, you, uh, how did yeah. you make your grilled cheese sandwich? So I started with bread. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of bread? So I I actually use um, for this particular one. I used a uh, Mountain Home seven grain gluten free bread. Now before you turn off on that. It has a, the texture is perfect. It has a uh, meatiness to it that most really soft breads don't. So it holds up to being toasted. Um, then I used a very thinly sliced pepper jack cheese. And then I made a little bit of garlic butter to toast it on the outside with. And then um, normally I would put in like a very thin layer of raspberry jam before I grilled it. Uh -huh. Last night I did not, but that's, that's normal. So that tomato soup would go very well. The other yeah. thing that I think would do equally well with this, because you, you mentioned your shrimp, shrimp and risotto or your polenta, I, I have always been on a grits kick. So, oh, yeah. 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 
barbecue and grits with this wine. And I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> you'll just have to bear with me with my Southern California roots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so <laughs> um, somebody is making fun of the fact that you said I intimidated them. John, you could intimidate us. <laughs> okay, pal. <laughs> so, any other any other thoughts on this, on this wine? John, how did how did you do the uh, the barrel aging? Yeah, I was getting ready to go in there, but I feel like I've been talking an awful lot this evening. So, on the barrel age program for the Dolcetto, we actually did use on the seventeen. We used some new French oak, not very much. We used about 15% for the overall lot. The rest of it actually went in uh, one to two year old barrels only, not the older neutrals. So okay. it, um, when you are storing a red wine for a long time, you want to start with newer oak. It integrates very well. There comes a point when it's fairly young, about a year into barrel where you think you've over oaked it. You get this, this point and then you'll start coming down the other side where that has melded together, they've come together. And what you're receiving then are the benefits of aging in oak. You know, the slow oxygen absorption, the development of fruit, and the, more importantly, the development of those longer chains on the tannins. So that the mouth feel then develops well. Um, all of that takes a little concerted effort. You've got to really pay attention, but it, um, it's well worth it, especially when somebody like Jet gives you such wonderful treasure you definitely want to treat it that way. So, um, and I, I got to say, Jet, I love me some Jet Wilmoth. <laughs> you guys are doing great. Up <laughs> and, and plus, John, I really I, love your wife, Gay, because she keeps you in line. <laughs> that's true. Um, John, I have a question. I don't know if it's something you can really give a definitive answer about, but, you know, we talk about, and we've made mention of your, I don't know if odd is the right word, but you have very unique blends that you put together. Odd may be the right word, sir, um, but you have very unique blends. You know, what made you decide, let me try quinoa with the dolcetto? Like, where does that come from? Is that just literally you walking around going, well, I like the taste of that, and hmm, maybe that might taste good well with that, or or is there some I mean, other? That's, he's, a, he's, able, he's able to get away with that as our trophy wife. You know? <laughs> okay, that's it, buddy. <laughs> Glad you're coming off, sir. <laughs> Um, Perfect. Well, Rebecca, I think it starts with the voices in my head. <laughs> are, are, do those all sound like Joe? No, no. Some of them, <laughs> some of them oddly sound like this guy that keeps saying things like, wouldn't you really love some popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it comes from um, walking through the winery. So normally I don't taste during the day when we're at work in the barrels. I will occasionally. Um, I like to do it when it's quiet. And so I usually go in, stay late or go in Uber early at different times. And then the weekends for me, when I go in on Saturdays, usually are a good time for me to run around there, you know, early in the morning for an hour or so. I, I do suffer from easily brought on palate fatigue. So I can do, you know, quite a few samples, but after a while, I know my palate isn't as sharp. And when I hit that point, I stop tasting and then I'll wait and usually, you know, go back and do things but like right now this is gonna sound really bad when I have to taste new wines like when we start getting the red wines in 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 tank for harvest I won't brush my teeth until after I go through tasting those I'll rinse my mouth with like just black tea and then I taste then I'll go brush my teeth so nobody has to have the dragon breath Rebecca you don't need to look gross no I'm I come from a dental family I'm just waiting for my mom to comment about you saying you didn't brush your teeth that's all I'm that's all I'm saying <laughs> It's okay, I've got spares. <laughs> uh, so I, you know what, Brett, right now, Brett's watching this broadcast. He's like, how much has he been drinking? <laughs> None, buddy. <laughs> Just a sip. So, um, yeah, but no, it, it does. And, you know, Rachel will do the same thing. She has her routine as well, where she goes out, um, you know, at, at different times. And it's just, you start tasting those things. And then I'll sit down and think, well, you know, I really enjoyed this and this. What would it do with this? And trust me, quite a few things don't work out that way. Um, you know, sometimes you're just like, oh, for the love of what the hell did I do? Um, you know, and then sometimes it's like, huh, somebody's going to think I'm a genius. <laughs> no, it's not very rarely accurate, but it, it, does, it does work out. And I just, I, I thought the Dolcetto would go very, very well with that quinoa since they're both very ripe. And I wanted something 
to lift up the fruit because the dolcetto is actually on its own was actually very heavy for a dolcetto that year. It's not heavy like a petit verdot, but so that quinoa really did the trick. That was how it, it, it's just a, a sometimes it's a guessing game and sometimes it's a oh I remember let's do right. that right so um the the those oh god yeah I should have made that comment now I'm getting extra denture uh, uh comments mm -hmm. on Facebook yeah. <laughs> so, thank god nobody's asked about the trophy wife though <laughs> it's a new wine label coming out <laughs> it's gonna be me in a French maid outfit <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about that yeah, right. took a completely wrong turn, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, so um, actually back to the, the program then, Joe, um, with the barrel aging, of course, you, you guys were tasting it all the way through. Um, right. To, we're going to lead off with a few impressions of the 17s overall, and then we'll, we'll do our, our closing spiel here. But um, overall, the 17s that you've had so far, Rebecca, we'll start with you. Um, what's your impression of the 17 as a vintage? The 17s have just been incredible. And I remember when the the 17 harvest happened and that was a record harvest and it was just so much fruit and all of it just seemed to be amazing. And every time, I mean, it's, it's hard to talk to you guys during harvest and it's probably really hard to stay out of the way, but the 17 was interesting because I kept hearing this sort of buzz from production about how great all of the fruit was looking. And even though we were getting so much, it was like, but we're going to use all of it. I mean, there's so many different things that we're going to do. Everything is looking amazing. And that was really interesting and really fun to, to kind of be around to see. Um, and I think that it's it's come to fruition. You know, every wine from 17 that I've, that I've tried has, you know, like Dr. Becker and like, and like you, John, talk about and, and Joe is, you know, finding that great balance in the flavor where you have fruit, you have these dark, full-bodied undertones as well. You also have this great balance with the alcohol and everything is just really, really nice to drink. There's nothing that, you know, smacks you in the face um, right. bad way. There's just, you know, this really great, wonderful portfolio of wines that run the gamut. And that's the other thing about 2017. It wasn't just great for the red. It wasn't just great for the cabs. It was great for everything. Yes, you know, yes. our PNA was fantastic all the way to our to our Cabernets. You know, it's just, it's an incredible vintage year. So Joe, um, tasting through barrel samples and things, what, what are some of your memories of early on versus now at maturation? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, it's interesting just if you Look at this this style of wine for a second, because um, uh, or they, this this varietal, because they they talk about in in, um, in 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 Italy, grow you know producing this this wine uh, in a couple of different ways, and I and I think what's interesting is that you have on um, Monday you have the 18, which was a considerably hotter, um, lower yield year where you get. Um, a greater expression of, of, of as, as I keep saying, of the, of the darker notes. Um, and then you have 17, which is a theoretically cooler year because of Hurricane Harvey. And you get these, um, you get a kind of a lighter, just completely different style of wine. And, I, and you can taste that in our, in our Cabernets as well, too. You know, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Canada's 17 cab, um, you know, started out with, um, you know, kind of lighter um, new world notes and it's, it's, it's changed in the bottle over time and, and Jet's 18 is a, is a darker, a darker Cabernet, although his, his, his usually are, it's just, it's, 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 it's those two years are so interesting because the weather is just so completely different and you, you really do get two completely different styles of wine. Yes. Yeah, you do. I, um, you know, my impression, I love the 18 that is showing so beautifully. Um, and I think as a 17, this is showing a, a, a maturity that I didn't expect from the Dolcetto, mm -hmm. which was really nice, a very good surprise to find when I, I got it into the decanter. I very much enjoyed that um, about that year. You know, and I just real briefly before we do our conclusion here, I always fail and and mentioning these folks enough. Um, and it's it's my seller team. And, you know, I've got I've got. Dylan in the back, I've got Juan and Eddie and Daryl and Shane and Leander and Luis uh, and Manuel 
Um, you know, I, these are folks that, these are also the folks that are doing the work day to day, monitoring the wines, taking care of them, putting up with my insanity about every time I wanna do something different. But, you know, without a concerted team effort, we don't, we don't have what we have in the glass. So just a reminder, as an average, every glass of wine that you drink takes 33 people to get it to you. So it really is. Um, and if you talk about farm to table, baby, you can't get any closer to it than this. So, <laughs> yeah. So I want to say cheers to my team. Uh, we're starting into another harvest and I could not do anything without them. They are cheers. absolutely wonderful for that. Cheers so um, a reminder, Friday is the, um, the 2015 um, Dolcetto, which will be nice. If you want to save this wine like Monday, I'll remind you, pop it in the freezer, pop the bottle in the freezer and take it out on Friday. You can try all three. If you don't want to, if you want to enjoy the rest of this bottle, go for it. It's not a problem. You can always call us and order more. Exactly. So <laughs> Rebecca, what are we doing for next week's pack up again? Please remind everybody. Yes. So next week is interesting. We have one brand new release and then two library releases. So we've got our brand new Petite Syrah Reserve 2018 vintage that I'm really excited to try. Um, the last Petite Syrah we had was just incredible. So I'm, I'm really excited to try this one as well. And then we have our 2014 Chevaux Noir, which was the first vintage that we made that Cabernet Franc Merlot blend. So it's the first of that. And then we and also right. have a big Go ahead. for everybody, the 2014 Raven, which was the Raven that won the double gold and has been, you know, on lockdown in the cellar and nobody's really been able to get it that for quite some time. So the fact that we were <laughs> able to bring that out of the library um, was a big deal. So I'm hey, really excited for next week. Hey, if Chef is watching, Chef is going to be doing uh, next week, I believe, a cooking demo. Yes. Psst, hollandaise sauce, Chef. <laughs> and and uh, at, fr at Friday, we have a musical guest, don't we? Yes, yes, we do. Friday, Friday, Friday. And everybody better join in too because uh, this odd gentleman named Robert, uh, what's his last name again? Uh, Becker? Crouch. <laughs> Crouch. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. Robert and his, uh, his bluegrass band will be on. I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, and I, I think he will uh, bring a sense of levity to our, our broadcast <laughs> we have yet to achieve. <laughs> So, this is true. <laughs> okay, folks, I, I hope to see everybody again on Friday, uh, you know, figuratively, of course, but <laughs> so I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening with this wine. Joe, Rebecca, absolutely fantastic for joining us again. Thank you. And uh, cheers to everyone. Cheers. Great cheers. wine. Enjoy your week.